The Norwalk Historical Society is pleased to host this evening's presentation, Connecticut's Changing Coastline, as part of the programming connected with our new exhibition, Norwalk's Changing Communities, 13,000 BC through 1835. Uh, this, ex this exhibition was funded in part by grants from Connecticut Humanities and the City of Norwalk Historical Commission. Now, our guest presenter tonight is Patrick J. Lynch. Patrick Lynch is an author, illustrator, photographer, and artist. He retired from Yale University after 45 years as an interactive media designer, medical illustrator, biomedical and scientific photographer, video producer, and for the past 30 years, a director of media and communications departments, and a designer of interactive multimedia teaching, training, and informational software and websites. He has won over 35 national and international awards for his medical illustration, publications, and software design. He's authored and illustrated nine books, and over 100 professional papers, magazine articles, and book chapters. In 2017, Yale University Press published his book, A Field Guide to Long Island Sound, which I have, and it's a fantastic book. My husband and I use it all the time when we're walking our dog around the Norwalk River, um, so highly recommend it. And in late 2008, uh, Yale University Press published his ninth book, A Field Guide to Cape Cod, including Nantucket, Martha's Vineyard, Block Island, and Eastern Long Island. And uh, all those places are really close to us, and a lot of them I know we all like to vacation at. So once again, a, a great field guide to take with you on vacation. So without further ado, uh, let me introduce Patrick J. Lynch. Take it away. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks very much for the introduction and the kind words. Um, I am an author, let's see, uh, of a number of different, what I've been doing oh, for the past, uh, say, 15 years or so, is a series of field guides, mostly about um, the Atlantic coast. So Long Island Sound, Southeast Coast and the Gulf of Mexico, Cape Cod, Mid-Atlantic Coast. And um, I, I've always, uh, as sort of as a philosophy, um, uh, oriented the guides to particular environments, salt marshes or beaches, dunes, whatever. Um, and particularly with an interest in the why of things, not just a catalog of the what that you might see, say, in a salt marsh, but how did things in a particular area get to be the way they are, the, the sort of historical why of things. And that caused me to sort of back into an interest in geology. Um, I should fess up, I have a master's in biology, not ge uh, geology, so I'm not a professional geologist. And if there's any professional geologists out there, I'll probably make them teeth, their teeth itch um, with some of the sort of simplifications of things um, because Connecticut's geology can be very complex. Um, but uh, if you're interested in, in diving deeper, particularly into the bedrock history of Connecticut, this is an excellent book, The Geologic History of Connecticut's Bedrock. Uh, the, the state DEP sells it. It's, um, it's hardly a book. It's more, more of a very thick uh, color pamphlet, uh, but it's excellent in going over in reasonably plain English the almost 1 billion year history of Connecticut's rocks. So I strongly recommend that. The other book that I always recommend to people, it's a little bit hard to find now because it's been out of print for some years. Uh, the state of Connecticut published The Face of Connecticut, Michael Bell's book uh, in the, I think early to mid 1980s. It's out of print for a while. Normally you can find it online in, in um, Amazon or, uh, or eBay or other places that sell used books for pretty reasonable prices. Um, so I would definitely track it down if you have a general interest in the, both the, uh, what I would say the geology and the geography of the face of Connecticut for all kinds of reasons, whether your interests are historical or minor 
primarily natural history related, it's just an excellent sort of overview of how Connecticut as we see it today came to be. And it's quite complex. Um, believe it or not, this is, the, this is the training wheels simple version of the geology of Connecticut. And as I'll explain, an awful lot of things have happened over the course of the last, I'm going to concentrate on the last half billion years, the 500 million years and forward from that. But there's been um, very dramatic history, uh, which is now luckily, um, uh, uh, we don't want volcanoes and earthquakes going off and things like that the way they used to. So we've been pretty quiet for the last, oh, say, 100 million years or so. So you don't need to worry about disasters. But uh, our history in the deep past was quite complex. And you can see that now in many places. This is a road cut on Route 9 in the Higginham area, where there's been so much crunching and folding and things you actually see these double arcs of you know um hard rock behaving like toothpaste under all the all the dramatic events in the past but luckily they are mostly behind us now in modern geology is almost entirely based on uh, the plate tectonics theory understanding that the earth has relatively stable in the long term plates of rock which float like a crust off the, um, over the surface of the Earth's mantle, which is much more pliable. And, and these plates move around almost like bumper cars. And as we'll see, um, Connecticut's been bumped into several times or the territory that later became Connecticut. So plate tectonics is, is the foundation for a lot of modern geology. And uh, based on the notion that continents move around, bump into each other, get pulled apart from each other, um, this is how Connecticut came to be. You can see these, what geologists call terrain. A terrain is a large area that shares general similarities in bedrock. So there's a number of different terrains which make up Connecticut and New England. And this is a quick and highly simplified explanation of how they came to be. Proto-North America is the plate that later became North America. This cross section of the ocean is what you, you see the red line here. The ocean here is not the Atlantic. This was hundreds of millions of years before the Atlantic even existed, as I'll explain. And uh, so Connecticut's uh, bedrock is partly um, originated in this proto-North American plate, uh, partly originated, if you can believe it, in uh, the African plate, which used to be bumped up right against us. Uh, 250 million years ago, you could walk to North Africa from what later became Connecticut. And in this ocean in between, there were island arcs of volcanic islands. Uh, usually you hear Avalonia, the larger, more substantial of the arcs, de uh, described as a Japan-like chain of islands, um, oceanic islands. The Bronson chain was also volcanic, smaller, and came to uh, uh, eventually represent a long arc of unique geology through um, not just Connecticut, but goes all the way up into northern Maine, etc. And uh, at this time, 500 million years ago, the ocean was called the Yapitos Ocean, and uh, Avalonia or Avalon um, uh, and Bronson were two of the major components here. Um, basically, things were crunching together at this point. The, the general movement in this cross section was Africa and North America moving ever so slowly, inches per year, but we're talking about millions of years, um, crunching together, crunching Avalon um, and Bronson together, and essentially erasing the existence of the Yapitos Ocean. But um, not erasing the bedrock oceanic crust underneath it, which um, as you can see in this light green color, um, uh, uh, still dominates in terms of the rock 
uh, uh, origins of a lot of New England here. So that was half a billion years ago. Uh, this is a, a three-dimensional view of the same sort of thing, the proto-North American plate. We had ancient um, carbonate banks and coral reefs off the surface of uh, what was then as I say, sort of proto-North America uh, um, uh, 500 million years ago, those become important um, uh, later on because um, mostly New England's rocks are quite acidic. Um, uh, that's the origin of all this stuff. Um, on the Western part of Connecticut in the uplands of, of that area, we have marbles and limestones, which have unique plants and animals in them, which really um, uh, uh, help increase our diversity in our little state uh, quite a bit. Um, so it's worth remembering those. This is where that marble and limestone came from. They're mostly ancient coral reefs. So you, here you can see the volcanic uh, Bolton Range, the much larger Avalon uh, island chain, sort of Japan-like. Um, and the Yapatos Ocean is being crushed uh, together from this, this arc across the illustration here is, represents about a thousand miles. Um, consider when you look at these complicated um, geologic maps of Connecticut that what was a thousand miles wide got crunched down to about a hundred miles wide. So that gives you some idea of the drama involved. And as the Iapetus Ocean was being squeezed out of existence, uh, it slid underneath part of um, the uh, Bolton chain, and that's where the volcanoes come from. Avalon is very, very much older. These rocks, if you can believe it, are 800, 700 million years old. Uh, uh, so very, very old um, volcanic rocks here. And the whole ocean is being squished together to the point where 250 million years ago, the ocean's gone. It's been squished out. Uh, this is now Pangaea, this massive bumper car collision of all the major continents on the earth. Um, the cross section here is this red cross section. And as I said, from here, you could walk to what's now Morocco or Europe um, because everything was squished together. And that's how all of these complex things that used to be out in the ocean, including the Yapetus Ocean uh, uh, crust underneath, were all jammed together in near the area that later became Connecticut. And uh, this is the present day, this very simplified cross section uh, of here. This is us in North America. We got most of what crunched together uh, from, from those ocean things. So we've got uh, Yapetus terrain, the Bronson terrain, Avalonia or the Avalon terrain. And, um, but Africa and Europe also have big chunks of stuff. Avalonia underlies a lot of England um, at this point. So, so as things were pulled apart, um, some of it ended up on the other side of the ocean and the Atlantic Ocean um, over the last hundred million years um, originated and, and has been spreading these continents apart uh, ever since then. The Atlantic Ocean gets wider about one or two inches a year. It doesn't sound very impressive until you multiply by say 10 million and then it starts to become impressive. And an awful lot of the dramatic geologic stuff that happened to us earlier is now happening in the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, thankfully well away from us. So um, we in Connecticut are now uh, what geologists call a trailing edge coast. Nothing's trying to crunch into us. Uh, things in general are moving away from us. And our geology for the last hundred million years or so has been dominated primarily by erosion. Um, and then the ice ages, which I'll talk of, about later, but mostly dominated by erosion. So uh, thankfully, all the drama is in our past. No volcanoes are going to go off or something like that although they were um, important in our past. So these are the terrains as you might see them today. Again, very simplified versions of them. Um, but in addition to the Yapetus terrain, the light green and the pinkish Avalon island chain that crunched into us and the rocks that originated there and the smaller Bronson um, volcanic chain, there is this big unique feature 
in the middle of the state and not just Connecticut, it goes all the way up into, oh, parts of the valley go all the way up past uh, White River Junction in Vermont and New Hampshire. So it's an extensive valley, but uh, it is not a river valley. Um, uh, I, the name I like for it is Central Valley of New England. Uh, um, many people call it the Connecticut Valley, uh, even though it goes way up past Connecticut. Um, but it's a rift valley, um, not a river valley. Um, so it's a rift valley that has a river in it, the Connecticut River. But the Connecticut River didn't create that valley. And I'll explain why that's important uh, a, a bit later. Um, but here you see in yellow, our rift valley. And a rift valley you could picture as a giant tension crack in the earth. As I said, when, when Pangaea began to break up and the Atlantic Ocean began to form and Africa and Europe drifted off toward where they ended up today, uh, there was a lot of pulling and tension on the earth's crust. And you can think of these valleys as giant cracks in the earth. That's what a rift valley is. There are faults on either side of it and a block drops down um, and that creates the, the rift valley. Um, you'll also notice in Connecticut, you can hardly not notice it, that our landscape from all those uh, collisions and crunching is fairly corrugated as uh, you know, you might say crunch the hood of a car or whatnot, it, it sort of accordion falls um, uh, under the pressure of crunching. And so what do I mean by corrugations? Picture yourself driving on the Merritt Parkway from Greenwich uh, heading say toward New Haven. And what are you doing? You're going up hills and down into valleys and up hills and down into valleys, you know, over and over again, uh, a couple of dozen times by the time you reach New Haven. And what you're doing is driving over those ancient corrugations, that crunching uh, of the geology that is still uh, a part of the bedrock geology. The corrugations are mostly north-south, not perfectly because this is the real world, but mostly north-south. And those were very important for uh, um, the first peoples, the Native Americans, in terms of their ability to travel. The rivers run in them, the Quinnipiac, the Housatonic, the Connecticut, of course, et cetera, uh, are run roughly um, uh, north-south with some important exceptions, um, which I'll talk about. And, um, and early colonial settlement, um, settlement, the same thing. There were no roads back in the 1600s and the rivers were the roads. The rivers followed these north-south corrugations. And, and so it made it a lot easier for, to, to settle um, uh, New England for the, for the Europeans who came. As I said, our Central Valley, um, big as it is, is not a river valley. It's a valley with a river in it. And um, this is how a rift valley forms. As I said, picture it like a sheet cake, uh, like a birthday cake, no frosting. And you grab one end and you grab the other end and you pull. And what's gonna happen? There eventually, as the tension increases, there are gonna be cracks. And um, that's basically on a much, much more massive scale, how rift valleys form. And uh, there are usually end up being faults on either side, these weak points where the crack develops and then the rift valley uh, drops down, um, uh, essentially filling the giant crack there. So that's the simple explanation of how rift valleys form. Probably the most famous rift valley right now in modern times is East Africa's rift valley, which is, if you can believe it, about 100 million years younger than, than uh, the Central Valley of, in Connecticut. Uh, so it's much more rugged, um, but that's because it's young. Our rift valley in Connecticut had mountains on either side of it at least as big as the Alps. So that's something to consider when you when I talk about erosion. We have the eroded stumps of what used to be very dramatic mountain chains on either side of the Connecticut Central Valley. 
Um, and you can get a taste of that by looking at, at the very much younger Rift Valley in East Africa with these steep sides and things. Now, um, say 50 million years on, it's going to be a much more gentle valley uh, um, if, if erosion proceeds and there are no more dramatic events here, um, as, as was the case in ours. Uh, um, uh, Rift Valley. So there's the Connecticut Valley, also called the Central Valley of, of New England, the Newark Basin, Gettysburg. All of these are, you could think of as Pangaea pulled apart and the space got filled by the Atlantic Ocean. Europe drifted away, Africa drifted away. These are giant tension cracks in the earth. These are best known because they are on dry land. There are at least a half a dozen more. Um, out on the continental shelf. There were more than just these few cracks. In fact, if you do fishing or whale watching, uh, you know the area off um, uh, east of Cape Cod is uh, the Great South Channel is another rift valley, the, the deep channel that runs between what's just east of Cape Cod and Georgia's bank um, further out. So lots of rift valleys. And ours is one of them, the Central Valley. Um, if you've never been to Dinosaur State Park uh, in Rocky Hill, I'd highly recommend it. It's a very small museum, but uh, the exhibits are unusually good quality for a, a small museum, including this spectacular mural, uh, huge mural by uh, William Sillen. He's a Massachusetts painter. And um, this is basically what our Central Valley looked like, uh, uh, say, 200 million years ago. And it's important, and I'll explain and show you some maps in a second, to realize that uh, if you could somehow be here um, at the time uh, the, that's depicted here, this was not like Rocky Hill, but with dinosaurs. It was um, uh, an almost unimaginably strange place that probably only a geologist would recognize as being related to Connecticut as we know it. Um, as I say, these mountains have already eroded down quite a bit, but they are much more dramatic than anything we see in Connecticut today. <coughs> this, this would be the eastern side of the Rift Valley. Uh, it also looks very tropical because it was very tropical. Um, the continental plates don't just slide around like bumper cars and bump into each other. They slide over the globe and um, believe it or not, uh, what later became Connecticut, the red star here, uh, was actually below the equator. The black line here is the equator. This was Southern Hemisphere. As I said, it was almost unimaginably strange. This valley was hundreds of miles from the nearest ocean, uh, and it was dry tropical, meaning uh, we can tell from the way sediments um, uh, eroded down that it was dry for part of the year and then very, had a very wet, rainy season. So um, very, very different than today. And those were the conditions under which um, our famous dinosaur prints were laid down. And um, again, I'd, if you haven't been to Dinosaur State Park, I'd highly recommend that it. it's an excellent museum. Um, sometimes you hear people say, it's a sort of a, a, a regional sort of urban myth that sometime in the distant past that the Connecticut River actually ran to New Haven and not out to Old Saybrook the way it does now. It does this funny dog leg, which we'll talk about in a little bit, uh, out of the Central Valley. And um, it, it's logical enough, the, the valley runs north-south, New, New Haven's at the bottom, say White River Junction's at the top. Uh, why doesn't the river go that way? Well, because in addition to all the eroded sediments that fill the valley now, there were in the distant past oh, say 170, 180 million years ago, a series of very dramatic uh, volcanic eruptions, which periodically filled the valley with lava and created um, huge uh, bubbles of lava underneath uh, what was then the ground level, sometimes um, uh, came out at ground level. And if you can believe a, a highly, highly liquid form of lava, almost like what you would see sort of in, in some of the Hawaiian islands would just spread out across the landscape. It must've been absolutely devastating and formed large horizontal plates of rock 
which then because of erosion, we're talking about, you know, many, many millions of years of uh, passing even between this, uh, the uh, volcanic eruptions, uh, reburied these things. But um, uh, there have been, you know, um, since then, 100 million years, at least of further uh, erosion, not just filling the valley again, but also taking a lot of this uh, valley material and, and washing it away, exposing these huge bubbles of magma that were originally under the surface and are now very much above the surface. And we know them all as familiar landmarks, West Rock, East Rock, Sleeping Giant, the Hanging Hills of Meriden is this big clot of things here. Uh, oh, the Hubline Tower that you can see sometimes when you're landing at Bradley, <coughs> or maybe you visited there, sits on the Metacomet Ridge, which goes all the way up well into Massachusetts and the Holyoke area and stuff. So um, big magma intrusions here. And this is the reason why the Connecticut River could not possibly have ever gone down to New Haven. Picture yourself driving on I-91 here. You pass Meriden and you go up uh, a very large uh, uh, hill going up steadily up to the top. There's a truck stop, rest stop up there if you're heading north. Uh, Mount Higby, a huge uh, trap rock uh, basalt um, ridge is above you on the right. And you go up hundreds of feet, even from the elevation of, of um, Meriden. And then you go down uh, a long slope of three or four miles, uh, which used to be notorious. I haven't seen them lately. Um, the Connecticut State Police would catch people going down. You go down this long slope for three or four miles, and you're going fast. So they'd put speed traps down there. And that's the reason. You've just driven over the reason why the Connecticut River could never have gone to New Haven, um, because a river can't go up several hundred feet. It's got to go somewhere else. And we'll talk a bit about um, uh, uh, the river later. But anyway, these trap rock ridges, um, they're also called uh, basalt ridges. Uh, um, geologists call them diabase basalt, particularly when the diabase is, is still buried. There were these big bubbles of magma that uh, originally back in ancient times, 200, 170 million years ago, were buried by all this millions of years of erosion coming off these alp-like mountains, which eroded uh, away now to what's just sort of stumps of, of their original size now, um, filling the valley with what later became brownstone. And that, um, if that name sounds familiar, um, it should be, it's the brownstone you think about um, as building material. It's a, it's a relatively soft, uh, reddish, brickish colored um, uh, sandstone um, with big magma intrusions in it. And these, as I said, sometimes the, these eruptions, these volcanic eruptions did not form the familiar conical volcano like Mount St. Helens or Mount Vesuvius or something like that, uh, or Mount Fuji say. Uh, they um, uh, uh, were definitely volcanoes, um, but the lava flowed out into the surface more often than not in sheets of, of um, uh, uh, magma that cooled down, uh, geologists call them traps. Um, and as I said, it must have been absolutely devastating to whatever was living there at the time. Uh, but um, uh, eventually, all this stuff, millions and millions of years of erosion, uh, not just deposition stuff coming down off the hills, but this stuff eroding away, eventually washing out to the sea. And now a lot of these big magma chambers are exposed in the landscape. We still have the sandstone here, uh, but now um, we call those exposed magma chambers, Sleeping Giant or East Rock or West Rock or the Hanging Hills of Meriden, et cetera. Um, and you'll notice that um, there's a distinct tilt to the trap rock. These lava flows were originally horizontal. Uh, but there is a large fault. Luckily, it's not like the San Andreas fault. It's not an active fault anymore. But there's a large fault on the eastern uh, uh, part of the Central Valley. And so things have slipped down on that side. And that's why our landscape very often looks tilted. Um, if you look at 
these large, um, like the Metacomet Ridge or East Rock, West Rock, uh, the Hanging Hills of Meriden, they all have a very distinctly tilted sort of look to them with um, a hard face usually on the Western side and a much more gentle slope on the Eastern. And that's because of this Eastern border fault and the slipping that's going on there. And there are places in the landscape where you can actually see that slipping. I live in North Haven. This is the Route 10 connector that connects I-91 to Whitney Avenue in Hamden. And they cut right through a, uh, um, a brownstone um, hill that was in the way of the connector. And here you can see exposed um, the natural brownstone beds, and you can see the downward eastern tilt of the beds right across the valley. And as I said, it's the same brownstone. If it sounds familiar, that's it. A lot of this stuff was quarried from Connecticut or from the Newark Basin, um, uh, which is filled with the same sort of um, ancient uh, sandstone. Uh, we call brownstone. There's a geologic sort of truth that what's hard is up high in the landscape and what's soft is below. And uh, these uh, trap rock ridges, these basalt ridges um, that originated as bubbles of magma under the earth are now exposed, um, not so much because they were uplifted, but um, because of all the softer sandstone is eroded away. So he, this is East Rock Park and East Rock in New Haven. And the Mill River here is running over those softer sandstones that have eroded away, leaving these um, huge trap rock ridges um, here. And as I say, they have a very distinctive asymmetric sort of profile and they're important uh, biologically in Connecticut uh, because um, they support a very unique um, habitat in them. They are higher and drier, uh, very much uh, more exposed in the wintertime, but very much warmer and drier than usual in the summertime. And so the things that live on them um, are, are unique. It's, it's a unique habitat that, that we have in Connecticut and, and Southern Massachusetts that you don't see elsewhere in New England. And again, this is was an ancient lava flow that was parallel to the ground and is now tilted because of that Eastern border fault. And here's a photograph of West Rock in New Haven, classic profile, um, sharp cliff on the Western, sometimes Western and Southern sides, much more gentle slope. And it's a big slab of rock that's tilted on its side, uh, sliding down because of that Eastern border fault. And um, when I started birding in Connecticut in the, uh, oh, this mid seventies or so. Um, peregrine falcons were extremely rare. You only saw them in maybe if you were very, very lucky in migration. DDT had a devastating effect on them. And if you had told me that um, by now uh, in, in uh, 2022, that there would be a half dozen peregrine falcon nests within the city of New Haven, you could have knocked me over with a feather. But peregrines love those trap rock ridges as do ravens and, and lots of other wildlife. So they really bring a lot of diversity to the landscape. Uh, and, and basically that's where they came from. Um, so uh, the next major thing that, that affected our landscape. And in fact, um, uh, probably even more so than a lot of the bedrock geology affect things that people notice in our landscape today was the so-called ice age. And uh, for real geologists, uh, you wanna make them crazy, talk about the ice age, because uh, a geologist would know that there have been dozens of ice ages, um, even in our local area. We have very little evidence of them because they tend to be very devastating uh, to whatever um, is on the ground before them. Anything softer than uh, granite bedrock um, tends to get scraped away. So, um, uh, but when people talk about the ice age from a geological point of view, what they're really talking about is the most recent one, which is called the Wisconsinan or Wisconsin glacial episode that peaked about 25,000 years ago. And um, it's called the Wisconsinan because most of the early work uh, uh, for people to understand that particular ice age was done in the Midwest. So Wisconsinan. 
peaked about 25,000 years ago. And it was a, a gigantic um, uh, a continental glacier that, that uh, ice sheet that spread across um, most of Northern North America. Uh, it's called the Laurentide Ice Sheet. Um, and it's probably easier to, rather than think about glaciers and mountain glaciers that people are most familiar with today, think of what happened as a gigantic extension of the polar ice cap. It's, it's like the North Pole and everything associated with it um, uh, uh, crept down over the landscape and covered up everything. And I do mean covered up everything. Uh, so this is what, um, say, back, say, between uh, roughly 50 to 25 million years ago, uh, the Connecticut area looked like, um, mostly dominated by that 100 million years of slow, quiet erosion. Um, if you could have been in this area, uh, what you would have seen, uh, particularly around us, um, uh, 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 in this region uh, would have looked more like what you'd see in um, New Jersey or uh, the, the central, um, say the Delmarva Peninsula or um, anywhere on the East Coast, really south of New, uh, of New York Harbor. Uh, very large, broad, flat uh, coastal plains of sediment um, uh, eroding off these ancient mountains. Um, uh, the Central Valley was there. And uh, what later became Long Island Sound was an ancient river valley. And that is typical of a lot of the features you see on the East Coast of the US. Um, uh, the Gulf of Maine, uh, the, the um, uh, uh, certainly Long Island Sound, the Gulf of Maine, um, Delaware Bay, Chesapeake Bay, they're all um, originated uh, at this time when the seas happened to be very much lower than today, probably about 400 feet lower than today back then, um, as river valleys, oops, jumped forward a little bit. Um, and that's where uh, this valley that later became Long Island Sound came from. It was not near the ocean, it was inland. Uh, we can only speculate about the rivers and how they were flowing at that time, but probably there was some precursor of the Connecticut and the Quinnipiac and, and the Lusitanic and whatever. Uh, a lot of this bedrock landscape hasn't changed that much. So there probably were, there were probably lakes in the valley as well, although we have only a little bit of evidence of exactly how big and where they were. And then a big coastal plain. This is now all the um, uh, uh, submerged under the Atlantic now, it's the continental shelf. But um, sea levels have gone up and down. Even in the past 2 million years, uh, sea levels have been as much as 250 feet higher than they are today, and as much as 400 feet lower than they are today. So sea levels change all the time. Um, we've been unusually lucky in the past, say, thousand years that sea levels have been relatively stable. Uh, but, but things are changing as we hear just about every day. So this is what the glaciers looked like when they got to our area. I put in for landmarks some of the um, major places uh, uh, just so you have some sort of orientation. Um, this line was the terminal uh, uh, end of the glacier, the terminal moraine uh, uh, 25,000 years ago. The glacier could not get any further south because uh, glaciers flow. It's a slow motion kind of uh, river of ice. Uh, they only flow in one direction. Glaciers never back up, they just melt away. And uh, when things got down to this level of what's now kind of the center backbone of Long Island, the rate of melting exactly matched the rate of forward movement in the glacier. And so there was a static standstill, um, geologists call it. And uh, that formed the backbone of Long Island. If you could have been where I am in North Haven or you are in Norwalk, um, up on the surface, it would have looked like central Greenland looks like today. Um, there would have been 5,000 feet of ice at least above us. Some areas in New England had as much as two miles thickness of ice above them. So no features, everything covered. 
including the White Mountains and everything else, all were um, under ice at that point. So amazingly different uh, than today. And if you've never seen glaciers, um, they're ice, of course, but they're nothing like the ice cubes in your refrigerator. They are dirty and gritty. And uh, my wife and I were um, hiking on Mount Rainier um, up above the tree line a few years back. And uh, this is one of the pictures I took of the several different glaciers there. This is a glacier. Um, this is uh, glacial ice. This is rock. Um, here's another glacier coming down off Mount Rainier here. And um, uh, it is, there are places where you can see obviously that it's ice, although very often they're covered with snow. This was in late summer, so um, uh, snow had melted back a lot, exposing the, the raw glacier ice. And they're so full of rock and debris that it can be very hard at times to figure out what's ice and what's rock. Uh, because there's so much rock within the ice and they can, they have so much grinding power, they can take supposedly a boulder the size of a bus and reduce it to rock powder in a decade or two. Um, that's how much power they have moving across the landscape. Um, glaciers uh, flow, um, as, as you know, uh, slowly, but they flow in a very um, uh, liquid way, albeit with a uh, um, much slower time base. And they tend to grind off virtually everything that's loose in the landscape and incorporate all of that, everything from house sized boulders down to uh, bits of fine silt and clay, um, all get incorporated into the glacial ice. Uh, partly a glacier moving across the landscape is sort of like a bulldozer. It will push any loose material uh, ahead of it. Um, and so that's one way that glaciers um, and uh, leave evidence of themselves there. Uh, there are bulldozed sorts of hills uh, that you see in the landscape. Uh, we call one of those bulldozed sorts of hills um, the base of Cape Cod, for example. Um, but mostly glaciers you could think of as gigantic conveyor belts. Uh, glaciers never flow in reverse. Um, they, they melt away when they go away. Uh, but as they reach a point where um, the melting rate is equal to the rate of glacier flow, all that ma rocky material that's in them gets dumped at the foot of the glacier here. And that's what's called a terminal moraine. And there are many moraines across our landscape. Uh, here, I say just 25,000 years ago, because again, the landscape was almost unimaginably strange by today's standards. Virtually everything is covered with ice. It looks like Greenland. You can see I put in for orientation the red outlines here are today's modern map. So here's New Haven, London, Stamford, et cetera. Long Island is here. And then on out, you're not seeing any ocean at this point because there was so much water um, incorporated into uh, the landscape uh, that um, the sea was sea level was 400 feet lower than it is today. Um, uh, George's Bank was not George's Bank. It was a gigantic peninsula that stuck out into uh, Long Island Sound, uh, or excuse me, uh, the Atlantic Ocean. Um, uh, but um, so that was, the peak was 25,000 years ago. By about 20,000 years ago, the ice had melted back quite a bit. And uh, uh, as you'd imagine, with all the melting that was going on in the warmer parts of the year, that there was just gigantic amounts of freshwater runoff. And uh, uh, at one point, uh, about 20,000 years ago, it filled that old ancient river valley uh, uh, in a way that made it look almost as if uh, uh, like Long Island Sound does today, except that this was all uh, glacial freshwater. Uh, it exited out through here, Glacial Lake, Block Island, and there were other glacial lakes as well um, were in the landscape. And I'll talk about those earlier. And uh, about 9,000 years ago, uh, Long Island Sound, as we knew it, began to uh, know it, began to form as sea level rose, the, the ice cap melted away, and um, and uh, the dates get a little fuzzy here because 
uh, all that weight of ice actually was so heavy that it pressed down the coastal crust, uh, the, the, the crust of New England. And as the ice melted away, the land started to rebound uh, in some parts of New England by several hundred feet. So it was almost a race between the rising sea and the rising uh, 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 land rebounding from um, being pressed down by the weight of the glaciers. And these are the glacial lakes. I wanna particularly call out this um, glacial lake Hitchcock, which went from the Rocky Hill area uh, all the way up through, as I said, to the main parts of the lake. Uh, the deepest parts were um, probably peaked out um, just above Greenfield in Massachusetts, but parts of the lake uh, went all the way up past White River Junction in Vermont. So it was a huge lake that existed for about 2,500 years. And it was basically um, dammed up that, that central valley by um, an earlier glacial lake had left uh, what's usually described as an earthen dam in the Rocky Hill area. We can see some of that um, dam today in, um, uh, that's what's underneath the tournament, uh, tournament players um, golf course in Rocky Hill is um, old remnants of that. There was a spillway a small spillway that, that let water out of the lake, but eventually that dam broke up and the lake existed for about 2,500 years or so. And by gradually about 18,000 years ago, um, it, uh, uh, it had largely drained away, but it left lake bed sediments all the way through here. And those lake bed sediments were enormously important um, for what happened later. Um, when you look at settlement patterns in New England, particularly after first contact and European settlements, they sort of logically sort of dotted along the coastline. And then suddenly you see settlements in the Hartford area, in the Springfield area, up in what's now called the Pioneer Valley area of Massachusetts. Well, why there? Uh, part of it was the Connecticut River was available to transport things up and down the river. But also this, this is the ancient lake bed of um, Glacial Lake Hitchcock. And unlike almost everywhere else in New England, this is deep, deep, very rich soil that is largely stone free. So that became the breadbasket, certainly of, of early colonial uh, North, uh, North America and the US, and, and it's still a major farming area today. Um, the glaciers did more than just leave lake beds. They scraped away all of our coastal plain and left these giant um, moraines in the landscape that formed the backbone of, of the, the sort of double backbone of Long Island. They scraped away our coastal plain. The sort of myth is that um, they dumped it all and that's what we call Long Island. Long Island existed. Uh, long, think of Long Island as a, as a layer cake and the glaciers left the frosting on top. So the glaciers didn't create Long Island, but they certainly created um, most of what you can visibly see on the landscape today. Um, and they scraped away our coastal plain and all the sediments that went with it, but they left us in Connecticut in particular with lots and lots of small but very fine natural harbors. And those became very important for early settlement uh, uh, of the Connecticut coastline. We have, um, unlike most of the Atlantic coast, we have excellent natural harbors um, all the way through here. These are the big regional moraines um, uh, uh, in the landscape that mark melting back points. This green um, area is uh, the maximum extent, the terminal moraine of the glacier. Uh, things melted back about, um, oh, say 4,000 years or so. And then for one reason or another, the climate cooled again and the melting stalled. And that's what created this Roanoke Point Moraine and Harbor Hill Moraine. When you look across Long Island Sound from say New Haven or anywhere east, and you see that long red row of cliffs, you're looking at the Roanoke Point Moraine. And those moraines go all the way across New England and formed uh, a lot of coastal Rhode Island, uh, the same moraine that created Montauk Point, created Block Island, and the highland areas of Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket. And that secondary um, recessional moraine created a lot of um, the highlands in uh, Cape Cod. 
And they left us with spectacular islands, which really increase our biodiversity and, and uh, recreational opportunities um, in the region. Our islands uh, in Long Island Sound are mostly glacial till islands. They're all the rubble that got swept off the landscape and um, got left in a series of moraines. Uh, so the Norwalk Island, Sheffield Island in the Norwalks, the Captain Islands, um, uh, 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 um, and a number of, actually most of our islands in Long Island Sound are glacial till islands. Uh, but there are some, famously the Thimble Islands in Brantford, which are bedrock islands. Um, they used to be the tops of hills that got drowned as the sea level rose, and now they're islands. Uh, very, very different um, in terms of their habitat than the glacial till islands. Um, why don't we have beaches? So much stuff melted away, uh, ran off the, uh, the landscape as the glaciers melted. So why don't we have um, more and better beaches? Say Cape Cod has great beaches, Rhode Island has great beaches, South Shore of Long Island. Why didn't we get that stuff? Well, um, we did sort of, but it all ran into Long Island Sound. Uh, so Long Island Sound, the average depth is about 63 feet now, which is very shallow for a body of water its size. It used to be quite a bit deeper, the valley that, that Long Island Sound fills, but now it's mostly full of all those glacial sediments that ran off Connecticut um, and didn't form beaches on their way to, uh, uh, to, to heading into Long Island Sound. So we don't have a lot of natural beaches in um, Connecticut, but the ones we do have are really important for wildlife, uh, such as Sandy Point that sticks out into New Haven Harbor. Uh, we do have decent beaches, small, but decent beaches at say like, uh, oh, um, Ham and Acid and Rocky Neck and, and some of the beaches around um, uh, uh, Norwalk and, and um, out in the New London area, but those are all, uh, manufactured beaches, um, nourished is what the, the term of art. Sand was brought in from somewhere else and that's why you have nice beach sand there. Mostly our uh, um, wild beaches are very much smaller and that's unfortunate for beach nesting birds because the, the, um, the degree to which uh, the Connecticut coast in particular is developed has left just a fraction of 1% of uh, our coastal mileage available to things like um, piping plovers and lease turns. So please, please, if you're out on a beach and you see nesting areas roped off, uh, please respect that. Um, uh, let's leave these guys um, a fraction of the 1% that they have now, because that's all they have left. So um, try to bash through this very quickly. What does climate change look like? If you were to go out say, you know, you hear about it in the news every day now. So what does it really look like in Connecticut? Well, this is um, the Barn Island area in Stonington, and uh, it's a beautiful day and a beautiful place, but you're actually looking at a tragedy here, uh, is the combination of high water and much more severe storms recently are breaking up this beautiful salt marsh, which used to fill this whole bay, even as recently as the 1930s. And all we have left are chunks of this high salt marsh plateau, these salt hay areas, uh, very quickly being eroded away. So you have to know what to look for. Um, and we're losing, um, uh, just not incidentally, as we lose these salt marshes, a huge amount of what um, uh, planners and ecologists call ecosystem services. For example, this is the salt marsh behind Sandy Point in West Haven, which really saved West Haven. In, in West Haven would have been devastated by Hurricane Sandy, Superstorm Sandy, uh, because of the way the winds came in and across New Haven Harbor. Uh, a sandy Point uh, and the marshes behind it were a giant sponge and breakwater that broke the force of the storm. Otherwise, coastal West Haven would have been devastated, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of damage. So aside from wildlife habitat and, and recreational um, opportunities, uh, we're losing important parts of our buffer against climate change. 
And unfortunately, a lot of the things that live in those marshes, like the salt marsh sparrow here, which nests in these high salt marsh habitats, which are very, very vulnerable to even millimeters of sea level rise, um, are having a hard time now. Salt marsh sparrows need to, uh, because they nest in these marshes, which flood um, uh, twice every, uh, every month in the normal spring tide, neap tide um, cycle, they've got to lay their eggs, hatch their chicks, and the chicks have to be old enough to be able to climb up grass stems in basically about three and a half weeks. And if they don't make it, uh, they drown. Uh, unfortunately, that's happening a lot more lately because of sea level rise. Um, our marshes are getting soaked and, and many of them are eroding away. So birds that, that nest in the marsh are having a hard time. And it's, um, it, it's really unfortunate because, uh, for example, our whole sport fishing industry is, is based on salt marshes. They're, um, only tropical rainforests are more productive than a salt marsh. And that includes our salt marshes, in, in this case, in the Barn Island marshes in Stonington. Um, uh, there's nothing more productive um, than a salt marsh except maybe a tropical rainforest. And all that uh, nutritive value goes into the sound and supports, among other things, virtually all of our food fish and sport fish. Um, and of course, as I said, they act as natural buffers against storms. Um, uh, sea level rise has been happening for 25,000 years. Um, the, the sea level is now two feet higher than it was in colonial times. And you see these odd, artif uh, 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 odd artifacts uh, say, this is the marshes, some of the marshes in, in Stonington in the Barn Island area. And there's old farm field um, walls in the middle of a salt marsh. Why would anyone do that sort of thing? Well, when these walls were built, these were corn fields and wheat fields in the early 1800s and, uh, or, or earlier. And, um, but now thanks to two feet of sea level rise, this is 100% salt marsh now all the way back. So you rarely hear in the history of the US, say, of the, and particularly the US East Coast with the older cities in it, you rarely hear about um, uh, uh, sea level rise until very recently because it was gradual. It was over say 300 years, um, those two feet of sea level rise. And so people gradually adapted without making a big deal about it. But now things are rising so much faster that, that um, uh, uh, you can see it um, if you pay any attention at all to the coast. This is um, uh, one of my favorite walks in Hammond Acid. It's, it's the uh, Cedar Island Trail. That's, it's one of the trails that goes out into the marsh and birders and natural history people will know it because there's a very nice observation platform at the end of it where you could go out and you know it's been there for various versions of it have been there for 30 years at least. And you could go see, for example, um, wintering uh, seals out in Clinton Harbor. And uh, this is the Cedar Island Trail here. Here's the observation platform. And you always had to bring a spotting scope because the seals were a long ways away once upon a time, but not anymore. Uh, the, the red line um, is the 1930s line um, established from aerial photographs done back then. Uh, the 2004 line um, is dramatically closer than it was before, but look at the present shoreline. I mean, this happened over a, a relatively long period of time. Uh, this happened like, you know, um, almost overnight. It's sort of shocking when you go out there now. You hardly need binoculars to look at the seals sometimes they're practically at your feet because these um i don't know how many uh dozens of acres of salt marsh have vanished over that time uh the hurricanes the severe northeasters etc have really blasted this area uh, i'm going to show you some pictures um uh, at, out at the end of meg's point that nice hike you can make from the parking lot um, down here in Hammond Asset uh, and um, out to the end of Meg's Point and looking across Clinton Harbor. Um, I happen to have a 2008 photograph of this. I actually did a painting of this area uh, much earlier than that where the salt marsh used to go way out 
into the rocks here. This is the Meg's Point moraine that goes out into Clinton Harbor and then reemerges on the other side. Look at where the salt marsh was in 2008. This is what it looked like a couple of years ago. It's all vanished. Um, and uh, ecologists call this a shifting baseline. That is, if you on a nice day go for a walk at Hammond Asset and walk out the Meg's Point moraine trail, um, you might never know that hundreds of, uh, well, certainly many, many dozens of acres of first-class salt marsh have vanished um, uh, over just a couple of decades. It's all gone. In fact, it's so gone that even the old salt marsh peat is, has eroded away now. It's just vanished. So um, when you go out into natural landscapes and you can see you know, um, big chunks of the marsh being still cut away here, when you go out into the landscape, please pay attention uh, to what you're seeing because we don't put up signs that say, you know, one fine day, there were many, many dozens of acres of important salt marsh here and now they're gone. Nobody makes that kind of sign, um, but people who go out into the landscape and look at it and pay attention to the details, you'll see the changes because unfortunately they're happening so fast that you know practically month to month, day to day, you'll see the changes in the landscape. So thank you very much for inviting me and I guess we'll do some questions. Patrick, that, that was just wonderful. Um, I think everybody was enthralled and um, and what's happening, you know, unfortunately, uh, losing our salt marshes that I don't think a lot of people are aware. Now we all are uh, aware and there is climate change. Um, if anybody has questions, please put the questions in the chat box and we will ask Patrick some questions. Um, and there is one here. Uh, it is from Lynn. Uh, her question is, um, it's about the heavy hunks of iron type rocks that float up on the beach in uh, Southeast facing at Cedar Point facing Concano. Do you know what those are? No, uh, a rock that floats? I'm not... Yep, the heavy hunks of iron type rocks that float up on the beach. That end oh. up on the beach. They're not mm -hmm. like any rocks that are around our area. They're like a basalt and they're sort of squarish, like they might have been cut out of a quarry or something. I We don't have anything that I know of that would be close to the water that they could come from unless they're coming down rivers or something. I don't know. They're very uh, heavy. Maybe if, if there's a river nearby, although usually rocks as big as I think you're describing wouldn't be moved around a lot. Um, so a lot of the rocks in Connecticut, certainly the, um, the reason why, uh, for example, our uh, trap rock ridges are, are all bright red is not because trap rock is bright red, it's actually a dark gray, but it has a lot of iron in it. Um, and as you know, uh, the iron rusts and, and creates that red color. And many of our rocks, not just the uh, um, basalts, um, uh, do have iron in them. And uh, and so it may be that from long immersion that um, uh, even if, if there's not a huge amount of iron in them, that um, the rocks have turned red uh, from that effectively rusting of the iron. Uh, someone had a suggestion maybe that Lynn's floating rock might be coal. Oh, sometimes you see coal on beaches. Mm -hmm. A lot of times it comes from ancient wrecks. Uh, used to be that the only bulk way to transport coal was in um, uh, huge sailing ships, which uh, very often got wrecked. And so um, it's not so much in Long Island Sound, which is very quiet, and doesn't have strong currents, but I see coal on the beach of say like the Outer Banks and places like that all the time, because there are a lot of wrecks offshore. There are a lot of big piles of coal where the old wrecks were, and um, eventually the coal gets washed onto the beach. Yeah, Lynn says there are dark gray rocks um, that come up. So, you know, it's a, it's a mystery. Um, yeah, I get, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and Holly says that the Connecticut face is digitized um, online. So just to let everybody know, um, and oh. you're getting a lot of kudos, uh, wonderful presentation. We've all learned a lot. 
Um, and uh, we thank you so much uh, for enlightening everyone on what's going on. Um, oh, thanks very much for the invitation uh, to speak. Yes. Oh, there's one more. There's a question here um, from Jeff uh, regarding the sea level rise. How long is the historical record provided by the Bridgeport Harbor uh, tide gauge? I don't know right offhand. Um, uh, but we do have fairly good records that go back at least through the 20th century. Uh, uh, whether they're detailed enough, it, it, sea level rise is very tricky. Um, and it's only been recently that we've been able to, through modern LIDAR and other kinds of specialized uh, satellite sensing technologies, if you can believe it, um, it, it it's hard to know, um, even as recently as the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and you look at, we've had good maps of the U.S. for a long time, um, the mm -hmm. USGS is, but it never mattered so much um, exactly what the elevations on the maps were as much as it does now, because suddenly just millimeters of change in the environment uh, uh, make a big difference. And so I, I'll bet that Bridgeport records go back way back and mm -hmm. you can um, use historical structures also to sort of verify um, how much it may have changed, say, over the last 50 years or 100 years. But um, uh, exactly how high a particular structure in, say, Bridgeport or New Haven or whatever is, say, a historical structure that's been there for s several hundred years, exactly how high it is above modern sea level, that actually turns out to be a very complicated question that we've only um, recently had the technology to determine because only recently, suddenly, every millimeter of sea level rise makes a difference. So in places like, uh, say, Norfolk, Virginia, where uh, that are, you know, actively flooding practically in every high tide, mm -hmm. um, uh, it, it becomes a very interesting question of how high is high, because... I um, say in a lot of the East Coast, that rebounding that I was talking about where the uh, the ice pressed down and stuff. Well, the East Coast is sort of like a giant teeter-totter. Our crust went down, down in Virginia, their crust went up, uh, but the ice is gone now and they've been losing altitude ever since. Mm -hmm. So every fraction of a millimeter matters when the sea is rising at you know about three to four millimeters uh, a year in that area, uh, so um, uh, how high is high turns out to be a, a really interesting question when every millimeter matters. Right, and that goes. It, it, this is a multi-part question. It says, what does the record show? Um, does it show an accelerating rate of rise? And in, yes. in those the records, rate. yes. Yes, absolutely. There's a sort of a dog leg, as there is in <laughs> other client measurements, where um, things, as I said, for 25,000 years, the sea has been rising. So that's no big surprise, at least to geologists. What is the unpleasant surprise is that the rates have changed dramatically and are now very much faster than they used to be. Yes. And the other question, where is the data available uh, from other LIS uh, gauges? Oh, I'm not sure offhand. Um, uh, first places I would look for detailed information like that are uh, go to Save the Sound um, is a good place to start, the Save the Sound organization. They do lots of mostly water quality things, but you may find links to, to other things there. The state DEP uh, does lots of survey work in Long Island Sound and has what they call the blue plan now, a master mm -hmm. sort of planning yep. um, uh, document that they've assembled to help everybody who uses the sound from recreational fishers all the way to um, people driving oil barges, um, you know, need this kind of data from time to time. So uh, start with Save the Sound, uh, start with the state, Connecticut State DEP, and, mm -hmm. uh, and go from there. Um, thank God for Google. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, here's another, could you talk about how the race was formed? Oh, mm -hmm. um, 
Interesting. Uh, well, uh, um, uh, just the peculiarities of the bedrock in that particular area um, is the first place to start. So just happenstance, that happened to be a pinching down of that ancient river valley in that area. But um, most, uh, most approximately say over the last few thousand years, it was that, um, uh, that line of moraines that formed Orient Point and Fisher's Island and stuff that um, uh, 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 left um, that glacial moraine there. And um, so uh, Orient Point, Fisher's Island, Great Gull Island, uh, uh, Gardner's Island, they're all bits and pieces of moraine in that area. And for one reason or another, the deepest point along that moraine is where the race is. The race is like 300 feet deep. It's very deep. Um, and it goes all the way down to bedrock. Um, and that's the in and out point, the eastern in and out point um, where Long Island Sound meets Block Island Sound and the Atlantic Ocean. Wow. All right, here's another question. Uh, we in Connecticut have brown or dark colored earth usually, but Long Island is red clay like on the North Shore. Why? Oh. Well, we have a fair amount of red clay too, but their red clay on the North Shore is that is that Harbor Point moraine um, uh, that that goes all the way out, forms um, the eroding North Shore. Um, those red cliffs that you can see when you look across Long Island Sound, that's the the Harbor Point um, uh, Roanoke moraine that goes all the way out and eventually forms um, Orient Point. That is all glacial till. It's dirt, rocks, and if you, everything from giant boulders and whatnot. Um, probably if you dig down into it, it gets brownish mm -hmm. or grayish. But on the surface, because of the iron content, it turns red. So, um, uh, uh, so um, uh, a, a lot of our dirt is, is not naturally red in color, uh, but because of the iron content, uh, becomes red when it's exposed on the surface. So the, all those point. cliffs, for example, in, in the North Shore mm -hmm. of Long Island are, are red because of essentially the rusting of the iron content. In the... Oh my. All right, we have a recommendation from Sean Martha that he uh, recommends that everybody uh, visit the Bruce Museum because uh, they have a natural history gallery in Greenwich. And the first third of it covers a lot of what you talked about, Patrick. So uh, oh, there's a couple of good, places. Good, good. Yes, it's an excellent museum. And Sean's a brilliant artist. He's done a lot of the diorama um, paintings and things there. So thank you, Sean. Yes. So I think we're uh, we at, we're at the end. Again, thank you so much, Patrick, uh, for this wonderful presentation. And I want to thank our mm -hmm. audience for attending. Um, we hope we hope you enjoy. But from the chat, yes, they enjoyed it very much. Um, oh, good. And uh, we, we invite you to uh, come to our next uh, lecture that's on February 3rd. Um, and this is about uh, childhood and colonial America. So uh, we will see you hopefully next time. And again, thank you all for coming. Thanks very much.